Okay. Everybody, can you see my screen? Yes, you can see your screen. Yeah. You see, so these are the, uh, I think, class quiz, class quiz two. So I just started looking. Uh, I mean, I will let you know that great. So in a day or two, that one, then midterm exam two, plus the other two, uh, I think homework three, four, still I did not let you know that great. Uh, but because you have the exam in next class, so that's why I like to discuss the answers with you. Uh, you all have submitted and then now you can note down the correct answers for you. So everybody see the first question was, uh, suppose you have two machines in the laboratory. One is DC and then other one is the AC. But somehow the nameplates of the machines got lost. So under this situation, how can you distinguish the AC and DC machines? So what answer have you written? So anybody, can you share what is the answer you have written? Tyler, so what, what is the answer you wrote? Uh, I'm trying to open the, the direct file now so I can give you a better answer to what I exactly wrote. Okay. So. I know one way was the AC has three terminals and the DC has two terminals. Right, right. That, that is on correct answer. And then what else? What else could be the point? So you, you, you remember, as I was telling you on that quiz day, that, uh, that, that you said, JC, that is by looking the external, externally. If it is DC, then there can be two terminals like positive, negative, and if it is three phase AC machine, there is a phase, B phase, C phase, whatever it is induction machine or synchronous machine, you can see. But when you say that there is two terminals for DC, what if, if it is single phase AC, then there can be two terminals as well, right? If it is single phase system, <laughs> single phase motor or single phase generator, then still there can be only two terminals. Then how do you understand that this is DC or AC? Um, my answer to this was to, if you were to open up the two machines, you could look for a field excitation circuit. Okay. So that would... in a field excitation circuit, both DC can be field excitation circuit, both AC synchronous machine can be field excitation, right? If it is well, yeah. synchronous machine, there can be field excitation. If it is induction, then there is no need field excitation. Then that point is right. If it is DC, then there is field excitation. You need a uh, field. So therefore, everybody say, if it is single phase, then in both cases, there can be two terminal. So then like you are confused whether it is AC or DC, then you need to look internally. If you see that there is a capacitor, then so that is the definitely AC, single phase induction motor. You cannot see the capacitor in case of the DC machine. So that is by looking the internal construction, you can distinguish. So therefore, mainly you will be telling two points under that situation when the nameplate information uh, got lost or you are not finding it, then you can say by looking externally, if it is if there are three terminals, then definitely that is the AC whether it is synchronous or induction. If there are two terminals, then that can be DC or can be AC. So to confirm that, you need to look internally. If you see the capacitor, then that is the AC, single phase AC. Otherwise, that is the DC. Okay, so the next one, you, you, you can note down. Uh, those things because th th I think this is the this will be the part of your exam uh, in next class. Uh, why does the main winding current lags the auxiliary winding current in a single phase split phase induction motor? So what was the answer? Did you write? So anybody can you share? What 
why does the main winding current lacks the auxiliary winding in the single phase induction, single phase split phase? So, as you know that in case of single phase split phase, there are two windings, auxiliary and then uh, main winding. So, the reason is that main winding has lower resistance as compared to the auxiliary winding. This means auxiliary, because auxiliary winding is thinner and main winding is thicker. So consequently, auxiliary winding has higher resistance than the main winding. And because it has the higher resistance and your voltage is the same. So consequently, this auxiliary winding current will lead the main winding current. Or in other words, main winding current will lag the auxiliary winding current. So therefore the answer is auxiliary winding has higher resistance than the main winding. So did you all write this answer? Uh, yeah, it's about what I put down. Uh, okay, okay. So, so everybody, uh, are, you, are you writing down in your note? Uh, so please note down uh, and then again. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, please you all note down the answers. Okay, now this one, number three, for a universal DC motor, how much torque will be developed if a capacitor is connected in series with the field circuit? Explain your answer. So how much torque will be produced? What you wrote, what is the answer? None. No, right, yes, that, that's the correct answer. So everybody see that because it is universal DC motor, meaning that you are applying the DC and it is the series DC motor, universal motor basically is the series motor. And because you are applying the DC and you are getting the capacitor in series with that field coil or field circuit. So because you are applying the DC, in case of DC, capacitor will be open circuited. Consequently, no current will flow. And if there is no current flow, then there is no um, part of mechanical power develop and hence no torque developed. So therefore the developed torque will be zero. That is the answer. So did, did everybody write that thing or you wrote something different? That's what I wrote. Uh, okay. Great. So number four, everybody see, if the rotor coil has no current, will the induction motor develop any torque? So again, in this case, answer is no, because there is no current. So then there is no question of uh, producing rotor flux. A stator may have flux, but if there is no rotor flux because of the lack of rotor current, then there will be no interaction. Consequently, there will be no torque developed. And then it says also under such condition, under such condition means there is no rotor coil current. Can there be any stator magnetic field assuming the power is being supplied to the stator? So then what you said, what you wrote for the second part? that power is being supplied to the stator, but somehow the rotor coil has no current, maybe because of open circuit or there can be some other issue on the rotor circuit, but stator circuit is fine. That is the meaning. So do you think that under that condition there will be magnetic field developed on the stator? So the answer is yes, because the stator, we are assuming the stator circuit is fine. So because you are applying the power, so it will produce the magnetic field. And then somehow there is no voltage and no current built up on the rotor coil. So that, that is different issue. This means issue is on the rotor circuit, but stator circuit is fine. So therefore answer will be, yes, uh, there will be stator magnetic field still, assuming the power is being supplied to the stator. Okay, and now the next one, what conditions must be made to connect two DC generators in parallel? 
So what conditions have you wrote? Um, the terminal voltages and polarities must be the same. Yes. So I think that is the correct answer because this is DC generator. So if you remember the AC generator, AC means uh, synchronous generator. For synchronous generators, you need to meet four conditions. Like their uh, RMS voltage should be the same. Their phase angle should be the same. They should have the same phase sequence and their speed should also be the same. I mean, the frequencies should be very closed initially and later that should also match. So there are four conditions, but because this is DC generator, so then there is no question of frequency, no question of uh, phase sequence, and no question of phase angle. So therefore you can, from those four points, you can eliminate three points. Therefore only point that their terminal voltage should be the same. They should produce the same voltage. And when you will be connecting, you connect to the positive terminal of one generator to the positive terminal of the other generator and connect negative and negative together. So the generator may have different ratings. For example, one may have just an example, 500 kilowatt, other can be 200 kilowatt. Rating may be different they may rotate at different speed that is no problem as long as they are producing the same voltage then that is fine so the voltage must be the same and then when making connection plus to plus and minus to minus so those are the two conditions i think everybody wrote accordingly right okay so the next one what is the reason for the higher starting torque of a capacitor start motor compared with that of a split phase induction motor? So as you've noticed that uh, in case of the capacitor start motor or even capacitor run motor, always it provides higher starting torque. So what, what is the reason? So the reason is that if, if you remember, we discussed that torque is proportional to the current of the main winding auxiliary winding and the sign of the angle between those two current this means t is proportional to im main winding current multiplied by ia auxiliary winding current multiplied by sine of alpha where alpha was the difference between the angles between main winding auxiliary winding so in, in case of a split phase motor, you notice that always both currents were lagging. One was leading, other was lagging, but both were lagging with respect to voltage. But in case of capacitor start motor, the current is leading. Consequently, the auxiliary winding current will lead much more as compared to the main winding and alpha value will be higher. It, even it, it may go close to 90 degrees. And because it is sine alpha, torque is proportional to sine alpha, consequently, it will give you the higher starting torque. So therefore, answer would be that in case of capacitor start motor, the auxiliary winding current leads the main winding current with a greater angle, with a big angle, which may be even close to 90 degree. That is the reason that it provides the higher starting torque. So how did you answer this one? What did you write? Did you also write the same thing? Yeah, I answered it the same way you did. Okay, okay, great. Okay, therefore everybody note down and then um, once I will let you know, then I'll write some feedback and then you can match the answers with you. And then again, these are the syllabus for the exams. <clears throat> okay. So now let's move the other one. Uh, everybody now, can you see this one? That midterm exam two? Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. I'll be a little bit discussing this one as well. Because again, like you have the exam in next class and after that, like you will present your projects, so we don't have much time. So that's why I'm 
discussing the answers for you today before starting today's uh, material. So, so I believe everybody write properly that why is not a single phase induction motor self starting? So because single phase induction motor produces a static and non-rotating magnetic field. So it is pulsating in nature and non-rotating. That is the reason it is not self starting Or in other words, its torque is zero. It does not have a starting torque. That's why the single phase induction motor is not self starting And the next one, what is the difference between a single phase capacitor start motor and single phase capacitor run motor? So the difference is that in case of a single phase start motor, that is only for starting purpose. Once the motor achieves or it attains about 75% of the synchronous speed, then that got disconnected with the help of a switch. On the other hand, capacitor run motor, it is always connected with the auxiliary winding during both starting and then running. This means 24 hours that is connected. So th that's the difference. If a capacitor is start motor just for starting purpose, that capacitor is used. And in case of a capacitor run motor, that is always running, that is always connected in the system. Then explain the role of damper winding in synchronous machines. So when I'm saying synchronous machine, then I'm expecting for both, both for synchronous generator and for synchronous motor. So therefore, in case of synchronous motor, damper winding is used to initially start the motor. Because you see in the first part, it is not self-starting. Now to initially start the motor, you need damper winding. And in case of synchronous generator, damper winding is used to eliminate hunting, to eliminate hunting effect. So that's the answer. So did, did you all write accordingly or you wrote something different? I've got exactly what you've got. Okay, okay. So that everybody, please just, you, you can note down uh, the, the answer. If you have write down the exact answer that I'm telling, then you are fine. Otherwise, if you see that I am telling different answer, then please you note down and then uh, again, think and then learn about the answers. That is the goal of this overview. Okay, then question number two, how does the field excitation affect the power factor in synchronous machines? Again, in this case, when I'm saying just synchronous machines, I am expecting the answer for both synchronous motor and synchronous generator. This means, that what is the impact of field excitation on the power factor in other words. So therefore we have to tell that three situation. If the field first go with the synchronous generator, if the field is field excitation is over excited, then the power factor is lagging for synchronous generator. If it is under excitation, then that is leading. And then when it is normal excitation, then that is unity power factor. On the other hand, in case of synchronous motor, when it is over excited, then the power factor is leading. When it is under excitation, then the power factor is lagging. And when it is normal excitation, then the power factor is unity. So did you all write the answer accordingly? Yeah, sure did. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes like a student swipe the motor thing they write for the generator and then <laughs> generator thing they write in the motor, etc. Anyway, because that is very confusing. That one very confusing. Okay, and number B. Why is a synchronous motor called induction start and synchronous run motor? 
So therefore, because again, likewise, the single phase induction motor, it is not self-starting. I think you notice that synchronous motor, when it is three phase, it is not self-starting. Now to start the motor, as we discussed, you need again the damper winding. So therefore damper winding help start the motor with the help of induction principle. And once it is locked with the synchronous speed of the field, then that runs at constant speed, which is called the synchronous run. So because it starts with the induction principle, that's why it is called induction start, and it is locked with the synchronous speed during running, that's why it is called synchronous run. So accordingly the name goes. Okay, then what information can be known from a V-curve and an inverted V-curve of a synchronous motor? So therefore information is that from the V-curve, we can know the relationship between armature or restrictor current and the field excitation or the field current. So therefore V-curve is essentially in the y-axis, vertical axis, armature current or restrictor current, and your horizontal axis or the x-axis, it is the field current. So that is the information. We can know the relationship between field current and armature current. And inverted V-curve, you can know the relationship between power factor and field current. So did you all write this thing or you wrote something different? So any opinion or anything? No yeah, I, I have what you answered it as. Oh, okay, okay, so th then fine, yeah. Okay, so uh, everybody, I mean, uh, so anybody, if you cannot follow me, then you stop and then again, I will explain, but please you all write down the answer because again, there will be comprehensive final exam as well, not, on, not just the third exam. Uh, you will take the final exam as well. So again, those type of question will come. Okay, so question number three, why are the auxiliary winding and main winding of a single phase induction or split phase induction motor thinner and thicker respectively? This means auxiliary winding has thinner winding and main winding has thicker winding. So what is the reason? So what is the answer we have wrote? I uh, said so the main winding needs to have less resistance and be able to carry more current than the auxiliary winding. Okay, yes. Uh, yeah, and oh, why it has to be sustained? Because main winding will be in the circuit always during starting and during running. And then auxiliary winding is only for the starting purpose because we are talking about the split phase capacitor motor. So even though you connect any capacitor, but that will be disconnected. So this means auxiliary winding will remain in the circuit only until the motor achieves 75% of the synchronous speed. In other words, auxiliary winding is short durated. Its duration is short for the operation. On the other hand, main winding will remain in the circuit all age during both starting and even running. So that's why the main winding needs to withstand or tolerate the current always. That's why that is the thicker. And then other one is the thinner. Okay, so then number B, how much torque will be produced if both the main winding and auxiliary winding current of a single phase induction motor have phase angles of 10 degrees? So then how much torque did you write? What is the answer? None. No, right, that's zero. Because again, that thing, you know, uh, IA multiplied by torque proportionate to IA multiplied by IM multiplied by sine of alpha, where alpha is the angle difference between those two currents, main winding current and auxiliary winding current. If both have the same phase angle, 10 degree, 10 degree, then the alpha is zero. There is no phase difference. Consequently, the torque will be zero. So did everybody write that answer? 
Okay, so I'm assuming that you did. Yeah, that's what I got. Okay, great. Yeah. Number C. Uh, so Nathan, did you notice that this time I did not mix them with the numerical problem? As you said <laughs> last time, there was mix of the <laughs> numerical problem. That's why I fully separated out here. Yeah. yeah, I, I agree. Really helped a lot. <laughs> yeah, it, it was a lot easier to go through the flow of the work without getting distracted by having to run through variables and then go back to another question and then run through variables again. It, it was great. Thank you. Yeah, no, no, that, that's fine. Yeah, my, my understanding was like before, okay, if you can write 3A, right, and then if B is the numerical problem, then again you will come back later and you will answer that. But this is also a good pattern here. Yeah. Anyway, so I will also follow the same thing in the third exam and the final exam. Okay. Everybody see number C. Uh, consider that you need to connect two three phase synchronous generators in parallel. So how can you ensure that both generators have the same phase sequence? So you know, today uh, and before we discuss that, you need to fulfill four conditions. So then phase sequence is one of those that both generators must have the same phase sequence. So how can you ensure that one? So how do you know that both generators have the same phase sequence? So what answer did you write? Anybody, Tyler, or did you write? For C, the four different, um, the four different things. There was um, the RMS voltages of the incoming generator must be the same as the running generator. The phase sequence of the voltage of the incoming generator must be the same as the running generator. The phase voltages must be the same and the frequencies must be the same. But, but, but it is not the question. So read the question. Right. Consider that you need to connect two, three phase in, in parallel. How can you ensure that both generators have the same phase sequence? What is the, so the, you, you mentioned those four conditions. That's right, those are the four conditions. But how can you ensure that both generators have the same phase sequence? So what, what test did you do in the lab? Yeah. In, the, in the lab you made on experiment, I think experiment number six, the uh, two synchronous generator making synchronization with the help of the lamp, synchronizing lamp. So that is the goal of making sure that the phase sequence is the same. If the all three bulbs, all three lights, becomes have the have the same brightness or the same darkness this means same illuminous level then that is the meaning of phase sequence is the same so that is on procedure that you can say that i can make sure i can ensure that with the help of synchronizing lamp test if they have the same level of brightness then that is indication of same phase sequence in addition without the bulb test, you can start on generator, and sorry, you can connect on induction motor with the three phase system, and notice the direction of rotation. Let's say it is running clockwise direction, and then you connect the same motor to the other generator that you want to bring into parallel. In that case also, if it runs in the same direction, meaning that they have the same phase sequence. So th those are the two ways that you can ensure that they have the same phase sequence. So everybody see the meaning of the, uh, read the question once again carefully. You need to connect to three phase synchronous generator in parallel. Then assume that one is already in service and other one you want to bring into practice. You want to connect. That is called the incoming and one is running. How can you ensure both generators have the same phase sequence? Because that is one of the four conditions that their phase sequence must be the same. That how can you determine or how can you ensure? So therefore with the help of the synchronizing lamp test as well as connecting an induction motor to the both system. If they have the same rotation direction then that is the indication of the having same phase sequence. So the Tyler, now do you understand? Yeah, yeah, I, I get it. Yeah, 
I mean, I mean, initially, even though you write that their voltage should be the voltage may be the same, but still phase sequence may not be the same. That is the point. Yeah. So, I have a question. Yes. So uh, I, I actually answered the second way that you had said hooking up an induction motor and seeing which direction the shaft turned. But yeah. so those um, those phase lights, is that something that we actually see in real practice? Because I, I thought about that, but I thought, oh, well, that was just for lab, just to be like, hey, just so you can see even more like, yeah, they're still in phase. But are those on normal? Um... Yeah, 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 yes. Th those are the normal procedure. Okay. Okay. In, cool. in, in, in those are the very very real practice, realistic thing. Yeah. Real or yeah, I didn't realize the synchronization lights were real. So okay, <laughs> cool. Thank you. It is not just for the lab or for the class. Yeah. Those are in real practice. So therefore, I mean, in the future, if uh, any of you have any chance to visit any power plant, in the power plant they have synchronous generators, and then you might ask that question: that how do you make synchronized? generators then exactly they will be telling those points those are the very very realistic situation okay so now come back the next question uh, how does a cumulative compound dc generator differ from a differential compound dc generator so what did you write in the answer so therefore cumulative compound uh dc generator i mean because it is uh, compound dc generator so this means it has both series field and it has both sound field so in case so if it is cumulative compound meaning that the both the series field and the sound field which is parallel field additive they are providing additive magnetization meaning that magnetic field is going to be much more strength is much more stronger and stronger and differential compound means they are kind of opposing each other so therefore the amount of magnetic field strength is reduced or becoming less that is the difference so cumulative on second cumulative compound means series field and sound field are helping each other it is additive and then in this case it is kind of subtractive they are trying to oppose each other that magnetic field that is the difference so question number b how does the slip of a single phase induction motor differ from that of a three phase induction motor so then what, what did you write here so the answer is in case of a three phase induction motor it has only like forward slip only one type of slip but in case of single phase induction motor, there are two types of slip. One slip is due to forward magnetic field. The other one is due to backward magnetic field. So th that's the difference. So in other words, the single phase induction motor had two types of slip. On the other hand, single three phase induction motor had only one type of slip, which is that due to forward field. That is the appropriate answer. Uh, then part C, uh, for the purpose of uh, power factor correction, which of the following motors would you choose? Explain your answer. Induction motor, synchronous motor, DC motor. So which motor did you choose? Synchronous motor. Okay, great. So what, what is the reason? It has the best power factor um, and it also Right. right so when i'm saying explain your answer then you can tell that uh, synchronous motor when it works under over excited mode and when it has almost no mechanical load connected at that time it behaves as a capacitor consequently it can uh, improve the power factor or it can correct the power factor so when I'm saying explain your answer, meaning that is the explanation that under a special condition that is under uh, overexcited mode, this behaves as a perfect capacitor. So this means this can improve the power factor. And then induction motor always it has lagging power factor. 
then that is the so you cannot use as a power factor corrector because it always draws the reactive power from the system so you cannot use and then you know dc motor of course there is no question of uh, any power factor there is no reactive power in this case because it is dc so therefore answer is synchronous motor and then you have to explain the answer okay so and then i will make the available uh, the i will upload the solution for the numerical problems five six six seven yeah. like the way i did before for the midterm exam i mean soon i will make the answers available so you, you can say oh, once i upload and then i will notify and then everybody you can say that where you made mistake so i'm going to upload very soon sometime today the answer for five six seven eight okay so does anybody have any questions here and then soon I'll, I'll let you know the grid also okay i'm assuming everybody is fine so let's uh, stop sharing this one and i think oh, okay this is that one this is this one okay hold on okay now everybody can you see those questions that i was discussing in the last class i think uh, we discussed up to two that during a transient fault and a permanent fault on the transmission line of a power network mention the sequence of a uh, line circuit breakers operation so we discussed this thing now everybody said number three in case of a network fault circuit breakers open and then again they reclose after some time interval so why is reclosing of circuit breakers needed so everybody if you remember the last class we were discussing when we are talking number two that fault happens and then within five cycles circuit breaker open and then again it needs some time waiting as I mentioned, 30 cycles to up to 60 cycles. Those are the like realistic practice. As I said, that MLGW waits 45 cycles after opening the breaker. I mean, different utility, different com uh, power company have different systems. Like MLGW wait 45 cycles. And then they reclose the breaker. So that I am asking, why is reclosing of circuit breakers needed? So what could be the answer? So therefore you see, because you open the breaker and then if the fault is cleared, then you should reconnect because if you don't reclose the breaker, then your circuit is disconnected. Consumers will not get power. So therefore in order to maintain, in order to maintain power continuity, the reclosing of circuit breaker is needed. So then everybody please write down the answer to maintain the power continuity or to provide the continuous power to the customers, circuit breakers needs to be reclosed. But, but, but if it is permanent fault, as uh, see again, a little bit go back to number two, transient fault, permanent fault, you will be reclosing the breaker in case of the transient fault. If it is permanent fault, of course, First, you will reclose the breaker. I mean, automatically it will be reclosed. But then, because it is permanent fault, like the in the example of the tree, tree has fallen, and unless the crewman operator came and removed that tree, fault is going on. That is the meaning of permanent fault. So, in that case, what will happen? You reclosed, but again within five cycles, circuit breakers will be open. Because circuit breaker the controller of the circuit breaker will understand that is still the fault is going on something wrong then again it will open and then again uh, after 30 to 45 cycle it will try to reclose automatically and then again it will understand that something wrong going on and then again it will reclose and so in that way like i asked mlgw they make three attempts their system is pre-programmed for three attempt three times reclosing 
then they will understand that okay, really something is bad going on, permanent fault, something happened, then the fourth attempt was not made. That depending on country, in some other country, only one attempt, only one attempt, reclosing, and then if the breaker gets open immediately within five cycle, that is the indication that permanent fault is going on. So because if you try multiple times, the breaker opening, okay, opening, closing, opening, closing, then at some point that breaker might be damaged. Because each time, think about each time when you are reclosing the breaker, still the fault is going on, permanent fault. Again, the huge current, very high current will flow through the circuit breaker. That may be very damaging for the circuit breaker because they, they, they are built with a certain capability. They have certain uh, withstanding capability. Therefore, multiple times you are opening, reclosing, opening, reclosing, then that cannot tolerate, so might be damaged. So that's why, as I said, that MLGW maximum, they attempt three, type, three times reclosing in case of permanent fault. Then they understand that something has happened and then they send the or operator or engineers to check and fix the issue. And then the circuit breakers reclosed. So everybody, could you follow me what I said? Yes, so far, yes. Yes, great, yeah. Okay, the question number four. These are very, you know, that uh, vital questions. Um, so sometimes in the job market, uh, just to test your uh, the basic capability, they might ask this type of question. Okay, at a steady state, is the frequency always 50 hertz or 60 hertz in a power network? So 50 hertz, 60 hertz, uh, what I mean that for here, United States, we have the 60 hertz, but in Europe, in Asia, they have the 50 hertz. So therefore, whatever the 50 hertz or 60 hertz, depending on the country. So do you think the frequency is always 60 hertz here in United States or for, uh, frequency is always 50 hertz? in the European circuit or Asian circuit? Do you think so? Uh, well, the answer is no, because the loads are changing. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, uh, but, but when I'm saying steady state, so steady state means that I am assuming there is no fault, no that three phase short circuit or those type of permanent fault. There, there is no, there is no huge transient, but what is happening? Always we are changing some load in real practice. Think, you see, like everybody you are using the laptop, like I'm using my laptop, I'm using my lights. Then maybe after the class, you, you might turn, turn down, you might stop that light, but you might again turn on your uh, other device, maybe television or you may cook or something. So therefore, <laughs> depending on customers, depending on people, because their pattern is different, continuously some change is going on. Or think about the University of Memphis. There are maybe 200, 300 rooms and continuously loads are changed in those rooms. Think about the normal situation, not this COVID situation, that classes are going properly on campus, but always there is change in each and every room. Some professors is teaching, other room is empty. Again, other professors is coming in that way, continuously there is some sort of change, meaning that load is being injected, load is being taken. Now you, you might argue, what is the issue if I change a load of only 40 watt light or 40 watt or 50 watt projector and computer? I mean, you are right. With respect to one classroom or one room or at your home, that is right. But you think about a large amount of consumer. Because in the University of Memphis, we, we have like 20,000, 22,000 students. So and continuously, you know, the rooms are being used. So if you sum up all those chains, then that is in some sense huge. So sometimes, even though at least what I'm saying that even though there is no fault, there is no transit, but because of those change, continuous change, always something is happening. That's why all, if you see that uh, swing equation that I was showing in last class, that phi a equal to phi a minus p, you assume that MLGW system is fine. They are providing us that mechanical power or the generated power properly. 
but as a customer we are continuously changing i mean and that changing it comes from the real life situation and it depends on my necessity i am changing consequently p is always like going little bit higher or going little bit lower and that is causing the frequency change so that's why the answer is the no so the frequency is not like perfectly 60 hertz here or in other countries not perfectly 50 hertz and when you explain then you will be explaining because continuously customers or people are changing their loads even at a steady state and if those situation is going on and then the transient happened some fault happened whether it's transient fault permanent fault then definitely there is big change of the frequency voltage power everything so therefore in the context of the question was even at steady state or normal situation the still frequency is not perfectly 60 hertz either a little bit higher or a little bit lower everybody could you follow me do, do, do you all get the answer yeah yes okay yeah definitely yeah yeah i mean i mean uh, i explain because that is the reason that explain your answer I mean if i if i don't add explain your answer then you will just say yes or no yeah so the <laughs> yes or no is not just the answer you explain something on on your behalf if you say yes it is always 60 then you answer on your behalf if you say no then still you explain on your behalf <laughs> that's why i said you have to explain you have to justify the answer not just the yes or no okay then Moving forward, then question now, what is swing equation? That is the answer. The equation that I'll showing like phi a equal to phi a minus phi. You will be writing that equation. It is called the power balance equation. That is the swing equation. And what is the steady steady stability and transient stability? You remember that last class I was showing you on slide, the definition of stability and then it has uh, two types. One is called steady state or small signal stability and then other one is the transient stability so steady state stability refers to the stable situation of power network under a small change for example in question number four i mentioned always people are changing a small a small amount of load so and then if the system is stable even if with those changes then that is called a steady steady stability or a small signal stability. On the other hand, system can be transiently, system can be stable following a major disturbance in the system. For example, huge fault happened, whether it is transient fault or permanent fault, but system came back after some oscillation, after some hiccup of voltage and power magnitude or speed magnitude, system came back. To an acceptable state, then that is called the transiently stable situation. And so, in other words, you will just briefly distinguish in that way. transient stability is applicable in case of large change, large disturbance, and steady state stability refers to the small change situation, small load change. Yes. Okay, so. Now, question number six, during a network fault, such as a three-phase short circuit, the voltage and active power of a synchronous generator drops, but the speed increases. Explain why the generator speed increases. So, meaning is that if you remember last class, uh, we were discussing the case of uh, both synchronous generator and induction generator. So in case of synchronous generator, we noticed that due to a three-phase short circuit fault or any type of the fault, both voltage and active power went down. First, first it drops and then it oscillates and finally settles down, but speed went up. So the question is why the generator speed increased instead of decreased? Because voltage and active power went down, they got dropped, so why the speed instead of dropping it increased so can you explain why the generator speed increases
So therefore, the, the answer will come again from that swing equation that phi a equal to phi m minus phi e because then active power drops, meaning that your phi value is going down. Phi value is going down out. So therefore, but we are assuming that mechanical power is constant. We are assuming that there is no disturbance on the mechanical input side because phi is going low, but the phi m is constant almost. There is no disturbance. Consequently, the generator will be accelerated. And that acceleration go in terms of the speed increase. That acceleration means that is translating the speed increase. So that is the reason, even though the voltage and active power go downward, but the speed goes upward. So everybody, could you follow me? So are, are you all writing down the answers? Okay, please, please note down the answers. Yeah. Okay, so the next question, why is a capacitor connected at the terminal of an induction generator? So why do you need a capacitor at the terminal of an induction generator? So what, what could be the answer? Would it just be to increase the power factor? Yeah, and so why why do you need to increase the power factor in case of induction generator? So if, if, if everyone, so what, I mean, Tyler, like why I'm asking that, huh? like read question eight, let's discuss simultaneously seven, eight, eight, why is not a capacitor used at the terminal of a synchronous generator? You see the difference? When it is induction generator, then I say capacitor is needed, then why it is connected? And then the reverse question, why is not a capacitor connected at the terminal of a synchronous generator? So everybody see the difference. You don't need a capacitor to be used at the terminal of synchronous generator, but when it is induction, then you need to connect a capacitor. So therefore Tyler, you said that is right, that to improve or increase the power factor, but why that power factor increase is needed, then why, why is not power factor improvement needed here? Why the power factor improvement needed here that is causing you, that is forcing you to connect a capacitor, and what is the problem here? Why the power factor improvement is not needed for this synchronous generator that is not forcing you to connect a capacitor? So you see everybody, so do you understand the context of the question? Yeah. In this case, you don't need why it is not. And in this case, you need the teller that you said that is right, you may not, but why the improvement is needed. So therefore everybody see if you remember, what was the uh, characteristics of that induction generator? The characteristics of, I mean, think about both, both induction generator, induction motor, whatever it is generator or motor, if it is induction machine, then that always draws reactive power from the system. Keep in mind, it is generator mode or whether it is motor mode, it doesn't matter. Always induction machine draws reactive power from the system. And why, why does it draw reactive power from the system? To produce required magnetization to produce required magnetic field. Because induction motor, induction generator does not have physical magnetic poles, unlike the synchronous machine or the DC machine. Synchronous generator, DC generator, DC machine, they have the physical magnetic poles. But in case of induction machine, whether it is induction generator or motor, they don't have physical magnetic poles. 
but for the operation of either motor or generator you know the basic principles you need the coil and you need the uh, re relative speed between the field and the coil and now we have to produce the magnetic field internally so that's why always it draws the reactive power from the matter from the system and because it draws the reactive power so you know the reactive power means power factor is low low lagging power factor and what is the consequence of that low lagging power factor consequence is that they will give you lower voltage they will give you the low voltage but then because it is generator you want to provide power to some customers with the help of induction generator the voltage should not be dropped down you have to maintain a certain voltage even though at i mean steady state conditions you, you have to maintain a certain voltage and if you cannot maintain the certain or required voltage then you can't maintain the required power for example you say induction motor is 2 megawatt rated but if the voltage is going down whatever current flows then you, you cannot maintain 2 megawatt so therefore what you have to do because it always draws reactive power consequently it makes low lagging power factor and that ultimately causes the voltage drop now to raise the voltage to maintain a rated voltage you have to improve the power factor that's why the capacitor is connected so therefore by the tyler that you said that is the right answer but when if you want to explain that thing you have to explain that because induction generator so therefore the appropriate answer you can write in that way that induction generator always draws reactive power from the connected network consequently the the power factor becomes low lagging and that may cause the voltage going down now in order to support the voltage in order to maintain a steady and rated voltage and rated power capacitors need to be connected at the terminal of the generator because capacitor can provide the improved power factor everybody could you follow me what i said yeah it's pretty clear yes 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 so then the, the, again, again like I, I i may not directly ask the question in that way for example maybe a little bit different way but then still you should be able to answer that's why i am giving you the detailed explanation so then everybody now come back why is not a capacitor used at the terminal of a synchronous generator so everybody you remember when we were discussing the synchronous generator we did not we never mentioned that we need a capacitor we we, we don't need a, to connect a capacitor then why so therefore what is your first guess first guess is that there of course there is difference in working principle there is difference in operation between induction machine and synchronous machine and in this case why we connected because we need to improve the power factor so therefore what is your first guess because we are not using capacitor meaning that for synchronous generator at least there is no issue of that low lagging power factor in case of synchronous generator power factor is not low lagging i mean power factor is lagging it is not fully one but it is not like induction generator so that's why because there is no power factor issue in case of synchronous generator that's why capacitor is not used now now the next question is that why why there is no power factor issue and uh, why the capacitor is not needed so therefore first thing is that in in this case why you need to provide the reactive power always why it is always drawing the reactive power because it does not have physical magnetic poles so therefore to answer this question number eight synchronous generator has physical magnetic poles right we notice that there is salient pole non-salient pole i mean visible pole or invisible pole but they have physical magnetic poles because they have the physical magnetic poles you don't need to take power from the system you, 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 if you have the physical magnetic poles, you need to provide DC excitation. 
that is different thing that is just to keep them energized keep the magnetic field present you need the dc excitation ac excitation or static excitation whatever it is but it has physical magnetic poles and because it has physical magnetic poles you don't need to take the reactive power from the system so that's why of course power factor is not always leading even not perfectly one so always power factor is below one but at least it does not have that issue that is that is present in induction generator because of its principle induction generator requires to draw the reactive power always from the system but because of its property that it has physical magnetic pole so at least you don't need to take the reactive power from the system so that's why it does not have the uh, issue of the power factor consequently you don't need the capacitor so that is one point the other point is that everybody if you can remember that we discussed uh, on this chapter synchronous machine that synchronous generator have avr and governor automatic voltage regulator and the governor control system there are two controller equipped and what does the avr do avr controls the voltage and what does the governor do governor controls the speed therefore and and then those two systems are 24 hours operating with the synchronous generator they have the automatic voltage regulator and governor one is ensuring the voltage and other one is ensuring the speed speed and in other or frequency and voltage or in other or power factor consequently always there is some sort of support even the during the steady state condition plus it does not draw any reactive power so you don't need capacitor and then now moving back again question number seven in one hand it does not have physical pulse second point it does not have any avr and governor control system everybody see the other bullet point here other catch point that induction generator does not have physical pulse also it does not have any avr and governor system therefore there is no controller except but that capacitor and that capacitor provides the reactive power to compensate that power factor ratio that's why this is essential this is mandatory part this capacitor in case of induction generator so everybody could you could you follow now yeah sure kid yes yes so therefore it, it depends on the property it depends on the characteristics of both generators and then now everybody come back to that uh, last class you see where if you, if you can remember i drew some curves for synchronous machine induction machine everybody look this one that number one that during a network fault draw the synchronous induction generator terminal voltage speed and real power if you can remember in case of induction generator when i drew voltage speed and power response voltage and real power i mean drop down and it reached it became close to zero and they did not come back because th that is the reason i mean and i use the word i think collapse down that voltage collapsed down in case of induction generator but if you remember or if you have the note in case of synchronous generator of course voltage went down or went down but then after some time they went up and it was oscillating in case of induction generator terminal voltage and real power if you see your note voltage went down and it never came back real power went down or it became close to zero and never came back that is the reason because of this thing because induction generator is always drawing the reactive power during both steady state condition and when there is fault in the system always it is drawing reactive power in addition induction generator does not have the avr and governor so therefore nobody there is no component or no part in the induction generator that is helping or supporting the voltage and power there is no component except that capacitor but this capacitor is a fixed capacitor 
keep in mind again i am moving with this capacitor is a fixed capacitor it is not like that okay during the fault it can change the value and it is uncontrolled if you see the class slides or if you read book or if you see if you google anything induction generator it has always a fixed capacitor it does not have any controller consequently it can change its value to be adaptive with the fault situation so that okay if you use the much more higher value then it can handle the terminal voltage and real power so that after some oscillation they come back they cannot come back so that is the reason so if you see the note in last class the synchronous generator versus induction generator those three variables terminal voltage and real power will always go down and they don't come back because of the property of induction generator so therefore then you you might ask the question you might argue then what happens in real practice if the voltage goes down and real power goes down and as i am telling they don't then what happens in real practice so therefore in real practice i mean in addition to this capacitor that is connected at the terminal at the grid side during fault condition you need to connect another reactive power compensator therefore there are some reactive power compensator not at the generator terminal but at the grid level so they work only during the fault situation the reactive power compensator like some sort of capacitor bank or it is called svc static bar compensator or it is called statcom static synchronous compensator or some sort of voltage regulator like mlgw system have some capacitor bank and they have some voltage regulator to tackle this fault situation they bring back the voltage so therefore in last class when i drew those curves i assumed that there is no compensator along the line because i was looking the dynamics of the generator only so that is the that is the and, and those are the difference between induction generator and synchronous generator if you are asked that question that what is the difference between induction generator and synchronous generator exactly those are the point you have to tell that it does not have physical power consequently it draws reactive power and it has low lagging power factor consequently it needs capacitor on the other hand synchronous generator have physical magnetic poles it does not require extra reactive power to produce magnetization in addition it has avr and governor control system equipped with it consequently it does not have any issue of low lagging power factor and hence capacitor is not needed and that is that and because it has that avr and governor system that's why the in question number 1 if you look their curves voltage speed everything after oscillation they came back they went down i mean in both cases went down if you see the curve carefully if fault happens it it is mandatory for every both machine voltage and power will go down and speed will go high but in case of synchronous machine after some oscillation they will come back to the original level or at least an acceptable level but induction machine they typically does not come back unless there is compensator at the grid level that is the difference okay uh, now we have uh, two more questions <clears throat> question number 9 everybody say when controlling a synchronous generator and an induction generator what are the main variables that should be taken care of so like something some answer will come from already what we have discussed so far when controlling a synchronous generator and an induction generator what are the main variables that should be taken care of so meaning of the question is that think that what is the property of synchronous generator and what is the property of induction generator so what is happening what we discussed in number 7 8 and number 1 the answer will come from there so therefore what did you notice in case of the induction generator you notice that you need a capacitor because it draws the reactive power during steady state condition during fault condition always it draws reactive power 
So therefore, when I'm saying, what are the main variables that should be taken care of, meaning that to control an induction generator, the first priority will be to control the reactive power, not the active power. So do you understand what I'm saying? Uh, so the, the, hold on. Uh, let me take you to the board. It will help you much more. Uh, what I am saying that so you, you all know this thing like this is that V, this is Q, and this is that power factor angle, and then this is this one. I mean, many times we discussed and. You all know this thing well. Okay, and then now what I am talking, I am talking uh, induction generator versus here the synchronous generator. What parameters need to be controlled? And what I said that if it is induction generator, because it draws the reactive power for its operation to produce magnetization, consequently it has the power factor issue. This means the first priority for induction generator that you must control the reactive power. So therefore, let me write down here. Therefore, the thing is that you have to first control the reactive power. That is the number one priority. Now, why I drew this picture? Now, everybody, if you see this picture, isn't that like real power, reactive power, apparent power, all are interrelated? Like all are interrelated. Through this equation through power factor. There is a relationship. So what I am saying that why I am emphasizing that for induction generator, we have to control the reactive power, not the active power. So do you understand what I am saying? On the other hand, if it is synchronous generator, then your first priority should be to control the active power or the real power, active or real power. So that should be the priority. If it is synchronous machine, first you have to control this one. And if it is induction machine, your first priority to control the reactive power. Why it is coming from the working principle? Because induction generator has low lagging power factor, always it draws the reactive power, first you have to control this one. Now, now you might argue that what's wrong if I first control the active power because it is interrelated. The answer is it will help you a little bit, but not mostly. On the other hand, if you control this one, then automatically this thing, uh, apparent power, theta, everything will be controlled. On the other hand, in case of synchronous machine, first priority should go the active, con active power control or real power control, not the reactive power control. Now, again, if you control the reactive power for synchronous machine, what is the issue? There is no issue. It will help you a little bit, but not the major, not the dom dominating factor. So meaning that if it is induction machine, the dominating factor, the priority should be given to reactive power control then the system will be stable. And if it is synchronous, you will be giving priority to this one. So, or, or in other words, in, in real life, what, what example I can give? Like, for example, what you do when you feel a little bit cold or you have a little bit fever? So what do you do at first? What is the first step you do? So everybody, so when you have a little fever or little temperature and little cold, then what do you do? Typically, you might take a little Tylenol or a little bit Motrin. And then that recovers you, or you try to like drink a little bit warm water. And then for example, everybody listen to me carefully, for example, that situation is going on for a week for 10 days. Like always you are feeling a little bit hot, your body temperature, not higher, like 100 degree or 99 degree or a little bit higher and always you are feeling cold, but next it continues like 10 days or two weeks. And you are trying to take Tylenol or the Motrin or the Advil. It looks like it is helping you, but it is not going. Then what you do, if it continues two weeks, then you go to doctor. And if you go to doctor, 
you know what doctor asked you that how many it is started then you said okay it is started 10 days back or three days back then doctor tests um, I have some test like blood test or other test and then then doctor concluded you have some sort of infection you have sinus infection or cold infection and then you need the appropriate medicine which is like some antibiotic and then yeah, if you take antibiotic then like that goes away so the same meaning when it is induction generator this is the antibiotic reactive power control is the antibiotic and active power control is the taking like tylenol or motrin same thing if it is synchronous machine active power control is the antibiotic and reactive power control is your tylenol taking that is the difference and then if everybody see, then if you control the reactive power so you understood that this should be the dominating this works as the antibiotic not just the normal medicine what does the reactive power will do it will control your power factor if you control reactive power it will and what else it will do consequently it will control your voltage so therefore in case of induction generator these three parameters for reactive power control power factor control and voltage control that is the same thing like telling the okay i will be controlling reactive power in other words meaning that that can control power factor and hence that can control voltage so these three should be the variable in case of induction generator in case of synchronous generator once you are controlling the active or the real power what is the thing happening i mean if you see that uh, equation we wrote for in case of the synchronous generator that uh, sorry pa equal to uh, pm minus p meaning that if you are controlling the active power what is doing assuming pm constant it is controlling the pa during normal condition it is zero but other condition because it is plus minus and it is acceleration or deceleration acceleration deceleration go down the shaft consequently frequency or speed can be changed so meaning that with the increase of phi or decrease of phi you can control this parameter that can control your let me write here that can control your speed or speed control means your frequency control therefore everybody see what i am emphasizing in case of synchronous generator these three parameter are important active power or real power control speed control and frequency control so now everybody see here there are total three variables here there are total three variables so therefore total three plus three six variables so this means that if i mean in real practice there can be some system that have both synchronous generator plus induction generator on service it is like hybrid power grid both type of generators now to maintain their stability to control them you need to make sure that all six parameters are in stable condition but if it is only induction you must give priority to these three variables these three variables are interrelated they are analogous in case of synchronous means these three parameters are analogous you must first control this and if you control these three automatically these three will be controlled in case of induction machine if you control these three automatically these three will be controlled because that is the reason I, they are interrelated they are interrelated but it depends on the mode of dominance who is thing should be given priority that is the thing everybody could you follow me what i am explaining do you understand everybody so therefore so that that is that is the answer to question number uh, this question number 9 so everybody now note down when controlling a synchronous generator and induction generator 
what are the main variables that should be taken care of so now you note down the answer or you can see the video later if it is synchronous generator write down the answer if it is synchronous generator the main variable should be active or real port speed and frequency and then write if it is induction generator the main variable should be reactive power power factor and voltage so everybody write down for induction generator reactive power power factor and voltage those three are analogous and main variable when it is synchronous generator active or real power speed and frequency those three variables are analogous and if a system have both both generator then you need to properly control all those six parameters or six variables everybody could you follow me yes i could yes okay okay great then the last questions for today and then i think your time is also up for induction motors and generators mention the direction of power flow to or from the grid for induction motor and generator mention the direction of power flow to and from the grid so this means that just i will take you to the board and uh, in a minute we will be done uh, hold on okay so everybody see the for example think about this is induction motor first and just i am drawing all line and here that is that grid it is connected to grid that is and then uh, and that below let's draw which is the uh, induction generator the bottom one and then again that is connected to grid so the question is mention the direction of power flow so therefore everybody see if it is induction motor what we discussed that it always draws the reactive power and because it is motor of course it needs the active power as well from the grid so therefore everybody see i said phi comma q this means both phi and q will be consumed from the grid to the motor or in other words the direction of power flow of real power reactive power is from the grid to the motor on the other hand when it is induction generator because everybody see what is the meaning of generator generator means it is providing the real power to the grid or to the customers therefore the direction will be phi but still the direction will be q from the grid to the generator that is the meaning of that question this means in this case you see both phi direction and q direction is from the grid to the motor in case of generator the direction of phi is from generator to grid but still the direction of q is from grid to generator therefore see in both cases q q from grid to generator the only difference in active power in case of motor active power goes from grid to motor in case of generator active power goes from generator to grid everybody could you follow me yeah that makes sense yes yes everybody so please re remember these things yeah, and this will be the answer so everybody note down i mean later you can see the video of course but you might note down and uh, you have to answer it and and you see that is the reason always it draws <laughs> reactive power even the generator mode see the direction of q and that q is needed to produce magnetization because they don't have both motor generator they don't have the physical magnetic poles unlike the synchronous machine that justifies that you need to connect a capacitor at the terminal that is the reason because in both mode it is drawing the reactive power okay so i think so you understood so therefore everybody so for that on <clears throat> that will be the answer i mean here i just said mention the direction of power flow to slash from the grid you can just draw those two figures 
or in sentence you can express that for induction motor both active power and reactive power will be from grid to the motor for generator active power will be from generator to grid but reactive power is still from grid to the generator either you can draw those two figures or you might express in sentences okay so i think we are almost done and then uh, <clears throat> In next slide, two slides, I have just mentioned a couple of uh, applications. So you will be just remembering those applications. Like there is one motor, it is called single phase synchronous motor, stepper motor. You know, the application is digital control system, printers, computer disk drives, VCR. So probably you know VCR, video cassette recorder. So, and then especially in clock, that stepper motor is like, you know, tick 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 at some degree and the input is given in terms of pulse so therefore stepper motor is the example of those things where it like it goes in some degrees so therefore i said step size typically vary from one degree two degree 2.5 degree if you see your like clock your like wrist or any clock wall clock like it goes tick 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 in that way that is the stepper motor <laughs> example and then another motor is called servo motor so in in this case you will be just looking the applications that that's fine we will not be discussing any detail working principle or any numerical problem just i am showing you some real life application of those motor that servo motor it is typically used in feedback control system in robotic system automated manufacturing or mainly the closed loop control system so therefore you will be keeping in mind typically they are used in feedback control system which is called the servo motor then there is other type of motor which is called the hysteresis motor typically they are used in cassette player or record player compact disc player sometimes in electrical clocks or the timers so main thing is that hysteresis motor they are used in cassette player. So have you, have you seen that cassette player? What I'm meaning that you have that tape and then where you can keep that uh, magnetic tape and then uh, you can listen to the song. And because you want to listen to the song and very, you know, that nicely and smoothly without any oscillation or without any torque, that's why the hysteresis motor is used. For these applications okay and then uh, uh, it'll be done in a few seconds linear induction motor the application is you know traveling cranes or conveyors door closure think about the like automated door you are entering and then door is getting open and then again door is closing in that case that is the motor but they are working along a line it is they are not like circularly rotating accordingly it is called linear induction motor so therefore example is that door closure conveyors or traveling the kind of unidirectional or the liner and then other type of motor is called reluctance motor it is used in electric clocks timers again record players or the cd player compact disc player and then again, there are some other motor. It is called shaded pole motor. So the application says like turntables, motion picture, small fans, bending machine. Those are called the shaded pole motor. So in that way, there are always small, small in you know, the size of the motor, and they have various types of application. So therefore, you will just be looking in these two slides the examples of those uh, application of the various types of motors okay so i think uh, <clears throat> it is over so those who have next class please you proceed uh, to the next class does anybody have any questions comments anything so if no then uh, thank you uh, nathan did you say anything oh I, I i said i think we're good i said thank you